Good morning. Our reading this morning on this beautiful Palm Sunday and first day of spring is Hebrews 9:11 through 14 and 10:11 through 18. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the bloods, blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclear, sanct unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So we're dealing with something that's just type really hard for modern people to deal with. We're dealing with sacrifice. We just don't like sacrifice. There's blood all through what Hanks has read. I mean, there's so much blood. And humans today, we just think that, you know, come on, Tim, why are you talking about blood? I mean, aren't we advanced beyond that as a, as a culture? I mean, come on. I mean, well, no, we're not. And I think one of the problems with that is we want to get beyond blood because we don't really want to look at the, the depth of the problem that we got to deal with. Um, so contemporary people, we don't want to deal with blood, but that just tells us that blood, which we know gives life, it is valuable to us. You know, it would be really hard for us to live if we didn't have our blood, you know. So if you're going to give blood towards something, that, that just tells you there's a depth of a problem that needs to be overcome. And that's what all this sacrifice stuff that's going on in the Old Testament is saying. There's a problem with us, and we need to deal with it. In fact, if you, know, you didn't have to do today in worship what they had to do in the Old Testament, because if you walked in, uh, which you really couldn't, to the tabernacle, you're going to hit three altars where there's going to be sacrifices. You know, there's the uh, sac altar of burnt offering, then there's the altar of incense, and then when you get into the Holy of Holies, which, by the way, none of us would have gotten into, there's the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, and there would be a blood sacrifice. You're going to put blood on this and that. There's just no way in the Bible to worship without blood. And I'm going to say this today. We're worshiping, but we can't worship without blood either. That's just the way it is. So Hebrews 10 tells us that in this situation of sacrifice and stuff, uh, Hank read this. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again and again and again, and he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's the Old Testament sacrificial system. It was set up by God, but there's this reality that it never got to the core problem, kind of covered some things. But blood is there. So I'm going to look at two issues about blood. I'm going to deal with negative connotations and positive. So let's look at the negative first. And this is kind of clear. If, like right now, if you're sitting there in a pew and blood starts gushing out your eye, you know something's wrong. Okay, so that's a negative connotation in blood in the Bible. There's something wrong with you if you see that kind of 
blood coming out. But also you can read in the Bible phrases such as there's blood on your hands. So now we know that that's a negative connotation with blood. It's, there's a guilt. There, you've done something. Blood is on your hands. Whether implicitly or explicitly, uh, this, this kind of, there's blood on your hands. You, uh, it's implied that you have a part to play in something that occurred that's negative. Isaiah writes, for your hands are stained with blood. And the stain is something you can't get rid of. So not only have you participated in something, but you can't get rid of it. I think blood is the most difficult stain to get out of clothing. Not that I wash, do the laundry or anything. I just, it's, it's something I hear about. But um, no, but you know, so there's this constant reminder that there's something wrong, that something's been broken, and just a blood stain. So Isaiah says that your hands are stained with blood. What blood taught people in sacrifices, and by extension what it's teaching us, is that, the wrong, that, that there's something wrong in this world, and there is a great price to deal with what that wrong is. Now, modern people believe, and I'm not saying that these things don't help to some extent, we believe in education. If you just educate people, you'll help them deal, overcome their problems, or if they would just morally become more uplifted, or, you know, practice religion, or just be more moral, or have some great therapy, that's going to solve all these problems. Well, they'll solve some of the problems, but most of the problems in the world are just um, emanating from a deeper problem that many people don't want to notice, and that's what Hebrews is dealing with, is that deeper problem, which is our human brokenness and sin. In Hebrews, um, they mention the term conscience. It's used three times in the book of Hebrews. In 9.9, it says this. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. So those sacrifices the priest did all the time, the person would come away and they did their worship duty, they did their whatever they're supposed to do, but their consciences were not cleared by that event. But then in 1022, it says here, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. We see something going on here in Hebrews that in Jesus, in this act of Jesus, we actually have the ability to not have a guilty conscience. But that that deep conscious thing can be healed. And in chapter 13, verses 18, pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. So we go from guilty conscience to uh, cleansing of a guilty conscience to we are sure that we have a clear conscience. Are you sure this morning that you have a clear conscience? That's a promise of Scripture through Jesus Christ. You can have a clear conscience. The word conscience refers to our self-evaluation of how we fit uh, we are to when we stand in the presence of someone. So again, Hebrews 10.22 says, let us draw near. Are you fit for the presence of God? Do you feel like you are fit for the presence of God? And what's the basis of your feeling that you would be fit to stand before God? Because he created you? Well, possibly. But you want to be able to stand before God comfortably, uh, welcomingly. And the reality is the conscience issue has to be dealt with. So a bad conscience senses that you or I could not survive close examination. I had a conversation this week. And can I just say the conversation, while I didn't think it was anything bad, my brain was playing all kinds of games with me. I would say I had a bad conscience. I think I did something wrong. And not only did I think I did something wrong, I really did. I would not have phrased it this way, but I felt like I could not stand up under examination. If I stood before someone who knew my heart and everything, and I stood there and I gave my reasons and this and that, they, I just didn't feel I could stand up legitimately and excuse away why I feel the way I feel. Because the, the finger would have pointed and said, no, Tim, that, that, the reason you feel that way is legitimate. That's this issue that keeps coming up. Human history is filled with attempts to assuage that feeling. Again, moral efforts, religious observances, uh, good deeds. And while they're all good, this is what they do. They leave people wanting. 
there's folks, you, some of you come to this church regularly on Sunday, and there's a part of you that's untouched. I, I don't know why. You walk away feeling guilty. There's something in your life you feel like you need to deal with or you need to somehow overcome. And I would argue that that's happening in churches all around this city this morning, that there are folks who are hoping to be released from guilt. And that what the sermon, what Hebrews tells us, is the way to get released from that is to come to Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can release you from this. So guilt comes alongside in these situations. Guilt describes what we have done. But here's the worst part of guilt. It's never alone. Shame comes along with it. And while guilt describes what we've done, shame describes what we are. Some folks live in this idea. You know, there's, there are cultures built on shame. They call them shame cultures. You lose face. Something happened. A son or a daughter did something and you lost face. And now your son and daughter is like, you don't want to deal with them because they caused you to lose face. Something that occurred lowered you in the estimation of the culture. And maybe it didn't, but it lowered you in your own eyes of how culture would see you. I'm so happy scripture tells us that what my son or daughter or somebody else does has no influence on me. I stand before the Lord on my own merits. I don't have to be concerned about these other things. I know it gets difficult. So the writer of Hebrews says that humans are all in the tent. There's a tent. You notice Hank read about a tent that's not made from creation. It's not made with human hands. It's It's the tabernacle that God has. It's the holy of holies that God has. It's Jesus Christ, by the way. That's who it is. But a lot of us still live in this earthly tent where we do our sacrifices to try to assuage God and and make uh, just kind of win our position with God. And what Hebrews is saying is get out of the earthly tent and get into the heavenly one who's Jesus Christ. Because if we just stay making sacrifices in this earthly tent, we're just weak and we're out of kilter and we're not aligned in our life the way we need to do. So the power, uh, so the, the solution here is the positive connotations of blood. It's a positive symbol. Blood equals life in, in scripture. There's no way you can have life without blood. There is no life without blood. If you attend, those of you who actually got to see your children born, One of the things you know about that is it's bloody. Life happens in the midst of blood. And I'm going to invoke this. We know because this is just popular stuff in our culture right now. The vampire myths say blood gives them life, right? I'm sorry to go vampirish on you right now. But, I mean, the reality is that it, it comes from a recognition that blood gives life. Blood equals life. So I got a story I got from Tim Keller retold this. Ernest Gordon was a prisoner of war in Thailand during World War II, and he wrote a book entitled Through the Valley of the Kwai to tell about his experiences. And he he talks about it was the end of the workday when this particular episode occurred. What they would do is they would collect the tools from the prisoners of war at the end of the day, and they would count them because you can't have missing tools just in case these guys would use one to escape. Turns out there was a tool missing. I think it was a a shovel. And the Japanese uh, guard was very angry at this. And he's kind of walking up and down the line of soldiers. They're not going to get away until whoever took this shovel is going to come forward. And he's he's ranting and raving. He finally gets to a point where he walks up to the first guy in line. He raises his rifle and he's going to shoot him. And he's going to go down the line until the person who took the shovel is going to fess up. So he pulls his rifle up, and he's pointing at this one, and this other guy somewhere else stands up, and he said, I did it. And this Japanese officer goes over to him, and he just beats him. He beats him. He kicks him. He knocks him down. And this guy, he's got blood coming off his head. And then finally, the officer takes his rifle, he takes that button, and he just comes down on top of the guy's head, crushes his skull, and the guy falls down dead. The rest of the soldiers pick him up and they carry him over to the burial area. 
the tools are recounted and they find out that there weren't any tools missing. But he stood, he stepped forward, he said, if someone doesn't step forward, there's going to be a lot of people dying today. You see, his blood had power. His blood had power. Those guys, just think about this, those guys could not live the same way after this. He stepped forward and gave his life for them. And I would argue, even you hearing this story, there's something that clicks in you and you say, Wow, that's powerful. I, I would love to live a little differently as a result of that story. He did that. Why can't I do that? There's power in blood. There's power in that story. He didn't just save them physically. He saved them spiritually. He changed the way that they would live from that point on. It says here in uh, Hebrews 9.12, Jesus did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. He took the brutality for us. He took the hits for us. In Acts 20, Paul encourages the Ephesian leaders by telling them this, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. That's us, right? We are bought with God's own blood. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. We were bought. Again, people will say, well, what's with all this blood? He's God. Can't he just do something? Can't he just forgive us? He's God. Can't he just blink or, or twitch or whatever you know, they do on TV shows that make everything all right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this. He says, if you have really forgiven someone who has threatened you. We're talking about forgiveness of something that had serious uh, issues to you. Not just like, oh, they lied to me. Or, but I'm talking about something that was serious. They, they lied to you. He says, if you have really forgiven someone who has threatened you with true harm, then you know suffering. To forgive that situation, you will have to take on suffering. Because it, forgiveness isn't an easy thing. Once you understand the debt that someone has to pay, you have two choices. First, you can make the perpetrator pay. But you know when you make the perpetrator pay, there's some evil that comes into your heart. Oh, I got him. And now you know what? I'm going to make you pay. You did this to me, and I'm going to make you pay. And there's this thing that comes back from that, and it affects your heart. There's an evil side to this. As you watch this person work off their debt, it's not just, it, it, this, this thing doesn't just go away. Or second, you forgive the debt. So evil will not fall into your heart. But it hurts. It hurts to forgive someone who has truly hurt you, dissed you, harmed you. It hurts to do that. But you know what? The hurt isn't evil. It just hurts. It's expensive. And what we know about God is God did not come to inflict more pain and violence on us. We got enough pain and violence in this world. He didn't come to do that. Instead, he sent Jesus. John Stott writes this, in a world of pain, how could you worship a God who was immune from it? Our God is not immune from pain. He understands what we live in every day. He understands our discouragements. And that's why Jesus, it's finished. He went in. He sacrificed, it's his own blood, it's done. He sat down, which means he doesn't have to do any of this anymore. So what's the extent of this transformation? To be religious, I talked about this last week, to be religious is to stay in the tent made with hands. And it's very easy to do. We just figure out ways that we're going to do things so that we think God will feel better about us. You know, I'm never going to miss a church service. Well, I actually think that's a good idea, by the way. But, I mean, but it, I'm going to argue with you about, what, well, what, why are you never going to miss a church service? Because Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling one of another. That's one way. Or I'm not going to miss a church service because when I meet the Lord, I want to be able to show him I was really committed. Now you're, you're just in the tent making a sacrifice that really can't deal with your guilt. 
what we find, or are you going to, emulating Jesus isn't going to work either. You know, what would Jesus do? We, we've been reading this book on Wednesday mornings, and he talks about, we can't do what Jesus would do, because we don't do the work that Jesus did before he got into a situation to figure out what he would do. But it doesn't work to emulate Jesus. We can't emulate Jesus, but you know what we got to do? We got to trust Jesus. We got to throw our lives into the arms of Jesus. So what we find is the blood utterly transforms us. The blood in this sacrifice on the cross that we're going to be looking at on Monday, Thursday, actually transforms us. The blood utterly transforms us subjectively because it saves us objectively. Uh, 1014 says, Because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Through one sacrifice... People are being made holy. They're sanctified. They're being set apart. Through that one sacrifice, when you come into faith with Christ, you're being set apart. You are able to serve him, love him, be in relationship with him in a way that you couldn't until you accepted that sacrifice for yourself. We're invited to draw near to God in full assurance because of what God has done about our flawed and sinful nature. It's not about we're, what we're able to do. We just say, okay, I'm trusting this thing that the Bible talks about, that Hebrews talks about. I'm trusting that event to allow me to come into your presence, Lord. The objective reality about sin is important, or this whole thing is subjectively ridiculous. So if there isn't an event that occurred in history that says Tim Bees is a fallen individual, that you're a fallen person, that you're broken, that you are not acceptable in God. If there is not something in history that says that, then this whole thing is ridiculous. It, we shouldn't be here at all. So, you know, you hear people say, oh, it's so wonderful that Jesus loves me so much and died for me. Ask him why. Really, why? Why is it so wonderful? Uh, so let's, here's the story. So I got two contrasting stories here. Let's say there's two of you. You're walking alongside a railroad track, and a train's coming along. You can kind of see it. You know, it's not a surprise. You're walking along. And your friend says to you, you know, I really love you. Let me show you how much I love you. And he just jumps in front of the train, gets crushed. And then your response is going to be like, oh, how much he loves me. No, it's not. You're going to go like, what was wrong with him, right? Okay, let's change the scenario a little bit. You're walking on the tracks, and this train comes around, and trains can do this as big and noisy as they are. It comes around the corner and just shocks the two of you, and this person pushes you out of the way and gets crushed. Now you're going to say a whole different issue there. You're going to go like, oh, gosh, I can't believe what he just did for me. There's an objective reality that just occurred, and it changes you. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, used to ask people, he's this guy that was in England, he was a big pastor. He would ask them, are you a Christian? And their response would be, well, I'm trying. I'm trying. And his response would be, in other words, you have no idea what a Christian is. Are you trying to be a Christian this morning? Because a person who is trying, still trying to be a Christian, is still in the tent, still doing sacrifices, still trying to be a good person. So what does it mean to be a Christian? Being a Christian is a, a new standing because of the infinite cost sacrifice of Christ. You, uh, because of what Christ has done, because you said, Lord, come fill me, uh, you've, paid for my sac you've paid for my sins, thank you, Lord, I want to follow you, you suddenly have a new standing you're in the Holy of Holies. You're in front of God because what Jesus has done for you. You see the difference? Two, the motives of our heart has changed when this occurs. 9.14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death? Now, you know, we, Pharisees are, are always bad guys in the Bible. But let's be clear about what a Pharisee is. They're a good person. They are rigorous 
in trying to be the most holy person they can be. But here's what he, but he would never feel like he is doing enough. Every day a Pharisee would wake up and he would go through his rituals, but at the end of the day, he would say, I didn't do enough. There's still more I could do. And that's a horrible place to be. Whereas a Christian repents of his or her own good works, and the reason he or she did the good things. And we've talked about repenting of your good works, not just your bad. If your good works are ways to make God happy about you, repent of them. In this situation, in religion, people do good things for the wrong reasons, but Christians do good deeds to please the one who saved them. It's a response of worship. To do good things in response to the one who saved you is worship. I'm saying, Lord, you are worth something, and I'm worshiping you, because worship has that idea of worth, uh, worth in it. We respond to God, the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. He took our curse so we could have his blessing. And we respond to him in worship, and that's why we change our lives. That's why there's this impact on us. But it comes from the blood of Christ. Here's my last closing story. I got this from uh, Tim Keller, too, which he got from Dick Lucas, and I'm just going to tell you that all sermons are derivative. I'm just going to be honest with you about that. So Billy Graham in 1955 had a crusade in Cambridge, England. This is early in, in Graham's career, and he wasn't really welcomed uh, in Cambridge because of his form of Christianity. People thought it was just too simplistic. Uh, you're dealing with the Church of England is in Cambridge, and that's where people would be trained to be priests in the Church of England. And there's just this kind of looking down one's nose at Graham. So what Billy did is he worked up some really academic-like messages for when he was there at Cambridge. And after two days, absolutely nothing had occurred at his, his crusade. Nothing had worked. There was no response, nothing. So on the third day, he just threw away all his messages. And he just started working in his sermon from, through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And all he did was talk about all the sacrifices in the Bible. And metaphorically, blood was flowing everywhere. I mean, it's just, just craziness. And afterward, they dismissed everybody, and there were some 400 young men and women who stayed. Cambridge University, undergrads and grads, these young folks stayed. And years later, Dick Lucas, who is a Bible teacher, pastor, lives in England, who had been there in 1955, he met this young curate, and he asked him when his faith began. And he told him, well, it started at Cambridge in 1955. So Dick asked him, so how did it happen? And he said, you know, I, I don't know. He said, when I walked out there that night, I knew Jesus had died for me. He was a good, this guy was a good person. But he said, that night, the blood of Jesus wrote on my heart the need for something deeper. And he was forever changed as a result of that. So we don't want to talk about blood and sacrifice, and yet blood is such a, an integral part of our faith as Christians. In this young man's life, the blood changed it. The, the application of blood opened up something to him. He was... He was already studying for the ministry, but in that moment, instead of studying for the ministry, he began studying for Jesus Christ, and he gave his life to Christ. He didn't, he didn't want to work in a church. He wanted to work for Christ. He just happened to be in a church. That's, I'm just trying to unpack this for us because I think sometimes it, it, it's hard to get this through our, our mental filters. It's great that we all come to church every Sunday. That's fantastic. But are you in relationship with Christ? Are you here because this is your family tradition? Are you here because you feel guilty and somehow this coming to church helps you deal with that guilt? That's great. I'm happy you're here. Please, don't get me wrong. But we come to church because of what Christ has done for us. If Christ is an abstract idea, then I, as a pastor, I would tell you, I should get out of this job, and we shouldn't meet anymore. Sin occurred. We can't fix that issue. Jesus fixed it for us. 
we have to ask Jesus into our lives. We have to make a commitment to the Lord. And then he just comes and embraces us and loves us and helps us on the journey. And now, because of his blood, we can, we can advance into the presence of God without a guilty conscience. Because Jesus takes care of of the deepest guilt that you and I can have. Are you here because that's occurred? I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm just saying, are you trusting the sacrifice that Hebrew talks about, Hebrews talks about to heal you, to save you, and to make you whole? Are you? Because there's power in the blood. I was going to tell Jim we ought to sing that today, but, you know, anyway, that's, that's cool. Let's pray. Let's do that. Lord, indeed, there is power in the blood. As humans, Father, we, we set up all kinds of uh, obstacles. Even in our best intentions, Lord, I, I believe we set up obstacles that keep us from coming to you trusting in you, listening to you, being guided by you. And the biggest obstacles of all come into this situation, Lord, when we're trying to make ourselves okay in front of you, when you've already made us okay in front of you. So I'd pray, Lord, that we would rest on this one sacrifice that Jesus made, as a high priest in the tabernacle of heaven. And then he sat down. That means there's no more work. Help us to trust in him. Cleanse our guilt. Help us to be thankful followers of Jesus Christ for all that he's done. May we live differently because of the blood. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We say, amen.